it seems only yesterday that we were anticipating the beginning of a new millennium. As the year 2000 approached, there was much interest in looking back at the last 1,000 years. One broadcasting network elected the 100 most influential persons of the last millennium. Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, John Glenn, Bill Gates, Louis Pasteur, Madame Curie, and 93 others were ranked in order of importance. When the countdown was complete, the person ranked number one in that listing was Johannes Gutenberg, who in 1454 printed his 42-line Bible, so-called because each page contained 42 lines of print. Gutenberg was credited with inventing the printing press. In fact, he did not invent the press, but he popularized its use in the West. Who can imagine life without books? Johannes Gutenberg, we salute you and those who follow in your train. Sometimes it seems that everyone you know is writing a book or planning to write one. My brother was a printer. He produced a book about his life and family. He asked me to make a contribution, and my part of it includes memories that may resonate with some of you people of a certain age. This is what I wrote for him. School was great, but summers were best of all. Summer meant playing outside after dark with the neighbor kids. Kick the can, hide and seek, flashlight. Oli oli outs and free meant you could touch base without penalty. We all went barefoot. We caught lightning bugs and put them in a jar. We wished upon a star. I wish I may, I wish I might, the first star I see out tonight. We never wanted to go to bed. When it was too hot in those pre-air conditioning days, we would drag the mattresses outside to the backyard and lie under the night sky and count the stars. Mother and Daddy had a black oscillating fan in their room, so they always stayed inside. Summer days included cutting out paper dolls under the tree in the backyard and spreading them out on a blanket. We played Gone with the Wind for hours. My sister and I read Nancy Drew mystery books aloud to each other. One story had to do with a deadly tarantula, which we pronounced tarantula. We also listened to the radio. Fibber McGee and Molly, The Lone Ranger, Mr. District Attorney, and it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Dun, 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 dun. We listened to the Green Hornet, Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, Henry Aldridge, One Man's Family, and The Shadow. Lamont Cranston had the ability to cloud men's minds so they could not see him. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. Ha 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 Radio was much more real than anything ever seen on television, the idea of which in those years seemed as unlikely as flying to the moon. It cost a dime to get into the Sunday afternoon movie. Children under five were admitted free. We saw Gene Autry and Hopalong Cassidy and the weekly episode of the latest series, the ending scene of which always left someone hanging from a cliff or dangling from an airplane. The next week, the hero would walk away from whatever disaster had befallen the week before. Do you remember? And do you remember Robert Fulgen's little book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? He wrote another one after that, entitled It Was on Fire When I Laid Down on It. In it, Fulgen tells a most wonderful story. Here's the story. John Pierpont died a failure. In 1866, at the age of 81, he came to the end of his days as a government clerk in Washington, D.C., with a long string of personal defeats abrading his spirit. Things began well enough. He graduated from Yale, which his grandfather had helped found, and chose education as his profession with some enthusiasm. He was a failure at school teaching. He was too easy on his students, and so he turned to the legal world for training. He was a failure as a lawyer. He was too generous to his clients and too concerned about justice to take the cases that brought good fees. 
The next career he took up was that of dry goods merchant. He was a failure as a businessman. He could not charge enough for his goods to make a profit, and he was too liberal with credit. In the meantime, he had been writing poetry, and though it was published, he didn't collect enough royalty to make a living. He was a failure as a poet. He decided to become a minister. He went off to Harvard Divinity School in Boston. But his position for prohibition and against slavery got him crossways with the influential members of his congregation, and he was forced to resign. He was a failure as a minister. Politics seemed a place where he could make some difference, and he was nominated as the Abolition Party candidate for governor of Massachusetts. He lost. Undaunted, he ran for Congress under the banner of the Free Soil Party. He lost. He was a failure as a politician. The Civil War came, and he volunteered as a chaplain of the 22nd Regiment of the Massachusetts Volunteers. Two weeks later, he quit, having found the task too much of a strain on his health. He was 76 years old. He couldn't make it as a chaplain. Someone found him an obscure job in the back offices of the Treasury Department in Washington, and he finished out the last five years of his life as a menial file clerk. He wasn't very good at that either. His heart wasn't in it. John Pierpont died a failure. He had accomplished nothing he set out to do or be. There is a small memorial stone marking his grave in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The words in the granite read, poet, preacher, philosopher, and philanthropist. From this distance in time, one might insist that he was not, in fact, a failure. His commitments to social justice, his desire to be a loving human being, his active engagement in the great issues of his time, and his faith in the power of the human mind, these are not failures. And much of what he thought of as defeat became success. Education was reformed, legal processes were improved, credit laws were changed, and above all, slavery was abolished once and for all. Why am I telling you this, Fulger writes? It's not an uncommon story. Many 19th century reformers had similar lives. In one very important sense, John Pierpont was not a failure. Every year, on December, we celebrate his success. We carry it in our hearts and in our minds, a lifelong memorial to him. It is a song, not about Jesus or angels or even Santa Claus. It's a terribly simple song about the simple joy of whizzing through the cold white dark of winter's gloom in a sleigh pulled by one horse and with the company of friends laughing and singing all the way. No more no less, Jingle Bells. John Pierpont wrote Jingle Bells. To write a song that stands for the simplest joys, to write a song that three or four hundred million people around the world know, a song about something they've never done but can imagine, a song that every one of us, large and small, can hoot out the moment the chord is struck on the piano and the chord is struck in our spirit. Well, that's not failure. One snowy afternoon in deep winter, John Pierpont penned the lines as a small gift for his family and congregation, and in doing so, left behind a permanent gift for Christmas. The best kind, not the one under the tree, but the invisible, invincible one of joy. P.S. And this is what Fulgham writes in closing. In the winter of 1987, in the Methow Valley of the Cascade Mountains of Washington State, I finally got a long-held wish. The snow was three feet deep. The temperature hung at zero. The sky was clear. The sleigh was open. The horse was dappled gray with red harness and bells. And we dashed over the snow, laughing all the way. Thanks, John Pierpont. Every word of the song is true. And thank you, Robert Fulgham. 
Now think with me a moment on this story and on our own stories. We step into the future confidently with bells ringing, singing and laughing all the way. It is not bells on bobbed tails that make our spirits bright. Our spirits are bright because of the Lord Christ himself. Our spirits are bright not because we can see the future, for we cannot. Our spirits are bright because we know the God who has been our help in ages past and is our sure hope for all the years to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this man and his character. We thank you that he wanted so desperately to serve humanity. And we thank you for the joy he brought us with jingle bells. But Lord, most of all, we think of the joy that we as believers have. We have that joy because the day we said, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior and I claim him as my Lord, we know that we have nothing more to fear. God, one of the things that you have done for us is to give us joy. Another is to take away our fears, even fears of death itself. We can face our future because we face it not alone, but the Jesus of the Bible of the New Testament stands beside us and walks with us all the way. And when we step over into glory, we will step over into his presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for joy. Thank you for confidence. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.